Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining the final session in our webinar series over the past five weeks. My name is Michelle and I'm part of the marketing team here at DDLS. Our final session is called Maintaining Productivity When Working From Home. Now, before we begin, I'd like to quickly run through some housekeeping. This webinar is in listen mode only and, be, and will be recorded and emailed to all attendees later this afternoon. This webinar will run for approximately 45 minutes with a Q&A session at the very end. If you have any questions, please type them into the question box in the control panel and we'll address it at the end of the webinar. Today, I am pleased to be joined by Sue Webb, our Process Portfolio Manager. I'd now like to hand it over to Sue. Thanks, Michelle. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the, the final in this series of webinars that we've been doing. It's been a lot of fun. Um, so this one is, as the, the name suggested, is all about productivity. So the, we're going to quickly run through sort of um, a bit of a deep dive into the top five tips on productivity that were introduced in the first of the series. So we're going to have a look at, we're going to talk about the importance of where you work, so your location, um, about getting ready for work, about your scheduling, having a plan, about communication and collaboration, and of course, very importantly, keeping yourself healthy. Um, and as Michelle said, we will have some time at the end for a um, bit of a summarisation and an opportunity for you guys to ask me some questions or to ask the DDLS some questions. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I've been with DDLS for just over 12 years and until and recently was a full-time instructor um, and I've recently moved into a portfolio management role. So I look after all the process products, um, but in the classroom I still deliver training in things like SQL Server, business analysis, business intelligence, uh, SharePoint, Office 365, Teams, those sorts of things. Um, so there's more about me. You can find out more about me on my LinkedIn profile if you want to dig into that. So we're going to have a look at these key areas that are important in maintaining productivity when working from home. And this is especially important because um, many of us might have worked from home previously, but only done so um, part time or only done so sporadically. Um, and we're about six weeks now into um, across the nation, many of us having to work to work from home full time. Um, and so being able to be productive um, is very important and being able to uh, set yourself up in a good location where you've got a clear work environment, where you're comfortable and where you're able to separate your work and your home life. Um, so you need to, in order to be productive, you need a workspace that's a designated environment that's comfortable and allows you to keep your, your work and home life separate. So the first of those, as I said, is about a clear work environment. So when you can, try and find yourself a dedicated and comfortable spot to work that you can associate with your job and where you can leave that spot when you're off the clock. So if you can sit down and be productive anywhere, that's great. It's unlikely that that will be um, able to be produced over time though. Um, so having a dedicated workspace, whether it's a separate room, um, a fully stocked desk, or just a clean part of your kitchen table. So that helps to tell your brain when you're in the place where you do work productively and without distraction. It's also important to have a separate workspace so that your brain knows mentally when you're at work and when you're off the clock. So that means you do need to get out of bed and, and you also need to get off the couch. Um, so it's very difficult for your brain if you're in the same physical location, whether you're um, at work or at home in your leisure time. The workspace needs to be comfortable, it needs to be well lit, comfortably heated or cooled and also well ventilated. So you need to look at all of these things where possible, where, where you've got some um, ability to control these things. So chair height is important, your chair choice um, is the chair height adjustable. Um, and if you can't adjust your chair height, can you adjust the, the surface that your computer or laptop or monitor is sitting on? It's not a good idea to sit at a dining table on a dining chair if you can avoid it because they're rarely ergonomically correct for work. Um, so 
other things, your monitor, I'm looking at a monitor right now, um, and the monitor height is adjusted so that I can sit with my neck facing forward without me needing to look down or look up. Because if you're sitting looking down for long periods of time, it can affect your, your neck and your shoulders and your posture and, and um, cause all sorts of other uh, postural issues. Um, now, your lighting's not always going to be easy to change at home, but maybe you could move your position to take better advantage of natural light. Um, and we often, we spend a lot of our time in video conferences. I know I spend quite a lot of my time in Zoom meetings as well as um, at meetings in Teams. If you've got a lot of light behind you, but no, none in front of you, your face will just be a dark shadow and people will struggle to communicate with you effectively because they won't be able to see any of the nonverbal cues that are on your face. And other things that you want to be able to do if you can to control the temperature of the space. You don't want to be too hot or too cold or sitting in a draft. So all of those things are important for your comfort. Um, it is really important for your mental health that you're able to separate your work and your home life. And that's really difficult when both of those things are occurring in the same physical location, in the same facility. So having that dedicated workspace is really key because that way your brain will know when you start or finish work. If you're sitting in the same room in the same chair with your laptop on your lap, your brain's not going to know whether you're working or not. Now, short term, that might be short term, that might be okay, but long term, it can cause mental health issues and interfere with sleep and all sorts of other problems. So maintain those spaces, have a dedicated space and maintain them as separate spaces. So don't be tempted to take your work into your leisure space um, so that you can mentally switch off when you remove yourself from the work environment. You want to limit distractions as much, much as possible. Um, and working from home presents a lot of distractions that you wouldn't normally find in an office setting. So you could be in a home that's got children or noise from outside you may find that a good pair of noise cancelling headphones will help you to stay focused and on task. Obviously, if you're caring for the one that's caring for those children, that can be problematic. Um, so other things, make sure at the end of the day that you change the status. So let others know that you're not at work. Um, now we use both Skype for Business and Teams in DDLS. And both of those applications have a status field that you can set that let others know that you're not on the clock. You do, if you're changing it manually, you need to remember to change it back the next day. Alternatively, you can set, if you're very disciplined and you can set these things in your calendar so people can check from your calendar when you're, what hours you're working. And it's important that you mentally clock off. So sometimes while we're working remotely, it feels like we're always on the clock, but we're not. Um, and it's not possible. No one can work productively for 12 hours a day. So you need to take your time at the end of every day for your mental health and well-being. Some, for some, that may mean changing out of your work clothes, but definitely moving to another part of the house and forgetting about work for a while. The second key point that we're going to look at is about getting ready for work. So when you work in an office, the daily routine of getting ready and commuting helps your brain get ready for the day. When you're working remotely, you need to create those start of the day triggers that get your head ready for work in a similar way. So as part of preparation for the day, we've got one thing that's the advantage, which is we no longer have to commute to work. And that may say, save several hours a day. So to give you an example, and I, I'm, I'm an extreme example. I live um, quite a long distance away. Um, takes me about 65 to 75 minutes to commute to work in each direction. I now use that time to exercise in the morning. So use that commute time to prepare for the day. It's a great time to exercise first thing in the morning. Um, now I'm not an exercise physiologist or a personal trainer, but I know from experience and from research that exercise, so getting your heart rate up, getting the blood pumping, it helps with lots of things. Um, it helps wake our brains up and gets us thinking clearly. It helps us sleep better at the end of the day. And it releases endorphins, which makes us feel good. And who doesn't want to feel good? So it's really, really good for mental health. So you might have a bit more time now. So use that time for exercise where you can. Use the time to spend time with your family or your pets. Um, and you may be able to combine exercise and spending time with the family or pets. It's also a good time to catch up on your favourite podcast. Um, and you can combine those things. It's, um, I start my day now. I 
take the dog for an hour long walk. And while I'm walking with the dog, I listen to my favorite podcast. So I'm doing all of those things at the same time. He loves it. I love it. It gives us a, a really good start to every day. Um, it's also important to get dressed. So as tempting as it is to roll out of bed and go to work while you're still in your pajamas, seriously, just don't do it. It's not good for you mentally. Certainly not every day of the week. You might choose a day where, you know, I used to, um, when I first started working from home, I used to have Pajama Tuesday. Um, and that was a thing. My team knew that to expect that. Um, but it is not a good plan for every day. So have a shower, get dressed, do your hair. Um, so the act of physically getting ready for remote work helps you to mentally get ready for a productive day. If you stay in your pyjamas, you're making it more difficult to get into the right mindset. Um, now, the photo that we're seeing here, this is my friend, Karma. She gave me permission to use this photo. Um, their organisation have a no pyjamas policy. So their teams wear onesies um, one day a week into their meetings. And that's a bit of fun that they have. So amongst your team, you can decide what's an appropriate dress. You can choose to have formal Fridays. If you had casual Fridays in the office and now every day's casual day, why not have formal Fridays? Why not have a hat day? Um, we had a company-wide meeting this week and the theme was wigs and hats and some people wore both and it was a lot of fun to see everybody just, and it's just things that everybody had lying around the house. Another very important thing to get you ready for the day is breakfast. So don't be tempted to just get up and jump straight online. If you do that, you may forget to have breakfast for several hours or you might skip it altogether. And we all know it's the most important meal of the day. So make time for breakfast before you go to work. And I have to share a funny story with you. Um, was ironically, while I was finalizing these slides yesterday, I got to this slide and I realized that I'd only had coffee um, that morning and I looked at the clock and it was 11.43 and my energy and my attention was really starting to wane because I hadn't eaten anything yet. So right at that time, I just took a break right there and then and went and had some baked beans. Um, and then I got back into it 15 minutes later. It would have been much better for me had I had breakfast at breakfast time and then had lunch at lunchtime. Um, it would have been better for my attention, better for my productivity, better for my energy levels throughout the day, my attention, everything. So I laughed at myself that I wasn't taking my own advice. The third thing we're going to talk about is having a plan. Um, so this is going to look at three factors. So when you're working alone, you will need to keep a more structured daily schedule than usual. So the first thing you need to decide on is what time you're going to start. So whether that's five in the morning or just after lunch, whatever your starting time is, stick to it. Once you start working, you should organise your daily work routine in a way that works for you. So that might mean answering your emails first thing in the morning or putting off meetings until the end of the day. But any schedule is better than winging it when it comes to remote work. The three factors we're going to dig into a little bit more deeply, we're going to talk about task management, prioritising those tasks and time management, which are three critical aspects of having your structured schedule. So a simple to-do list can do wonders. It helps keep you organised, motivated and productive as we work from home. So when you create your list, think about the big long-term goals like finishing a project as well as small goals. So completing tasks that lead to that big goal. Checking off those smaller goals let you know, lets you know you're making progress and that gives positive reinforcement throughout your day. Work also feels more doable when it's not all one giant task. So write or type out your list instead of just having it in your head because if you keep your list in your head, you're going to be constantly having to devote headspace to remembering what you have to do. And there's a lot of pleasure in crossing tasks off a list. Um, so when it comes to tasks, we've got sort of two different types of tasks. There are personal tasks and team tasks. So think about for your personal tasks. What do you need to do this morning? What do I need to do today? What do I need to do this week? And have those tasks been prioritised? And for the team tasks, it is the same thing. But when you've got both team tasks and personal tasks that are competing for your attention, is there an objective way for you to prioritise them so you know whether you should be attending to a personal task ahead of a team task? So we'll talk about the um, prioritisation shortly. It's also important if you're using task management tools, 
what are you using? So for team tasks, you might be using something like Planban or uh, Planban Planner or Kanban or something like Microsoft Project or Trello. Um, for personal tasks, there are lots of tools that you can use. Um, I personally, I just, I use one, OneNote mostly. I just use checklists in OneNote. Um, and then I also use Outlook a bit as well and put tasks into my calendar. But there's lots of different ways you can manage these tasks. As long as you can keep track of what needs to be done, how they're prioritised, how you're progressing with them, the, t the tool is really up to you. So prioritisation, prioritising tasks and other, asking others to help you prioritise tasks that they ask you to do, takes some of the stress out of having an ever-growing to-do list. So you should be prioritising your tasks using an agreed objective scale. Now, the one that I use the most is called Moscow. Um, and Moscow, you can use for prioritising tasks, you can use it for prioritising deliverables in projects, you can use it for prioritising projects. Um, I use it to prioritise my packing when I travel. Um, I use it to prioritise requirements when I want to buy something new, if I'm buying a new mobile phone or a motor vehicle or something like that, or even a fridge. Um, I use Moscow for everything. Moscow helps me to objectively determine what I absolutely and when we're talking about tasks, we use Moscow to say, what, what must we do? So the must haves, the must do's, these are the tasks that are, criti are mission critical, that absolutely have to be done. Um, that if these tasks are not done, they will affect others, they will stop other work from being done. And we shouldn't be planning any more than 60% of our effort on the must do's. The next level, the S in Moscow, stands for should do. So these are the tasks where we can technically live without them being completed, but it will cause some pain if they're not done. And we use 20% of our planned effort on our should do's. The could do's are our contingency. These are the tasks that can get de-scoped should we start running out of time. So we, don't, we also plan 20% on those. And you can see this falls into sort of the 80-20 rule where your must do's and your should do's combined should not be any more than 80% of your effort. Your could do's um, are at least 20%. The mix might be slightly different, it might be 50% must do's and 30% should do's, but you don't wanna break that 80-20 rule. If you've planned 100% of your day on must do's, you are not gonna finish that work in the time you've got allotted. Um, it's also important with your prioritisation that you've got some way to indicate the prioritisation of the tasks on the tasks themselves. So in Planner, we can use coloured tabs to indicate what's a must do, what's a should do, etc. In OneNote, I just use different colour highlighters to go over the tasks so I know which ones um, are the higher priorities. Now, time management is one of the things that most of us are notoriously bad at. Um, and it's because most tasks will take longer than we anticipate. We're notoriously bad at estimating how long a task is actually going to take. It's important when we're working remotely, when we're working on tasks, it's much easier to get distracted when you're working from home. So they're one of the biggest challenges of working remotely are distractions. So it's important that wherever possible, we avoid any non-work tasks. So, Schedule a separate time outside of your work time to do your laundry instead of tackling it while you're finishing a work presentation. Now, again, I had to laugh at that one because I was literally doing my washing while I was finishing this presentation. So I had to laugh at myself again. Um, but it is important that you avoid TV and social media during work time. So if you're using the same computer for home and work, close your tabs that have got your social media open. Um, one of the things I do, I've got separate Google accounts for work and for leisure, and I can only access Facebook through my leisure account, not through my work account. And I try not to launch, you know, to have my, my leisure account or my home account open on the work laptop while I'm working. And then at the end of the day, I close the work browser down and I fire up my social one and I jump onto Facebook and, and see what's happening in the world. Other things that we often forget about, there's a thing called the work interruption factor. In project management, we call this a whiff. 
And one of the things to recognize is that you cannot do eight hours worth of work in an eight hour day. There are factors that interrupt our work. We get interrupted by emails coming in. Um, it's a really good idea to turn off the little email notification, the little icon that pops up every time you get a new email in your inbox. It's a really good idea to turn those off because they will break your train of thought drag your attention away from whatever you're working on and then you've got to, to get you know ramp back up to get back on task um, so you can mitigate some of this if you're working on critical tasks put your um, put your devices put your statuses into do not disturb mode so people can't ring you so people can't send you an instant message and ask you if you've seen you know tiger king so do what you can to limit interruptions by others when you're working on critical work. Another thing that we need to be aware of is how much time we're spending on tasks. So be, keep track of how much time you're spending on them and don't go over the allotted time unless you can claw some time back from some of your contingency tasks by descoping those. So there's a thing called Parkinson's law, which tells us that work expands to fill the time available for its completion. So if you finish something early, don't faff around by putting finishing touches on it till all the time allocated to that task is gone because you may need that extra time for the next must-do task. The fourth area that we're going to talk about is about communication and collaboration. So we had a whole webinar a few weeks ago on collaboration and communication in remote teams. So if you missed that webinar, you can watch the recording on YouTube. Um, if you haven't got the link, you can ask us for it. But if you Google YouTube DDLS, you'll find the recordings. So when it comes to communication and collaboration, we're going to talk about the tools that you might use and the importance of chat and video calls. So we need to take advantage of collaboration tools. So tools like Office 365, Microsoft Teams, Slack, so that we can do things like collaborate. So co-authoring on documents. Um, we've been at DDLS, we've been working from home and using these tools for a few years now. And one of the, the richest experiences I've had is working with other people where we could all see the document, we could all interact with the document and we could change the bits and see what other people was, were doing. And at the same time, we had our headsets on and we were chatting to the other person. And it was actually a richer experience than had I been sitting next to the other person, because it's much harder when you when one person's sort of got the keyboard. Um, now, if you use Teams for collaboration, it also makes sense to use it for communication or vice versa. So there are some tools that you can use, use for both, that you can use for both collaboration and communication. So Teams is one of them, Slack's another. Um, other communication tools, we use Zoom quite a bit. Um, we use Teams, we use Skype for Business for our calls. Um, we are decommissioning Skype for Business though, and we'll be using Teams 100% um, for all of our communication shortly. It's important that you know how to use those tools productively. Um, and there is of course training available. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, it's important that you don't rely too heavily for productivity, that you don't rely too heavily on text-based communications. But because we can't communicate face-to-face, -face, because we can't just get up and go to the next cubicle and talk to our colleague, make take advantage of instant messaging and chat tools that you've got available to you through those communication tools, through your collaboration portal. And have chats that are both work-based and also casual. It's important to maintain those relationships with others. So again, it's within reason and within your organization's policies that you might do things like add photos and gifts to lighten the mood. We have a designated area in Microsoft Teams where we can upload photos and, and just find out how everybody is and how everybody's going and we communicate about various things that are independent of any of the actual work that we're doing. That's a, that's a real um, hub for, for people to just engage with each other and still feel like being part of the team, even though we're all isolated from each other. 
but it's important that you don't rely solely on text-based communications. So we need to go beyond email and use other digital tools that can better replicate the in-person experience and provide for clear communication. Um, and that there's a lot of evidence that text-based communications can be misinterpreted. Um, and you often have to send six or seven emails backwards and forwards to clarify an issue. Whereas if you picked up the phone or jumped to Betty at started a video call with the other person, you could spend 30 seconds and have the conversation, get to a decision and then use email to confirm what's been discussed. So don't be afraid to call people and even better video call people. So hearing an actual human voice or better yet seeing another human face can genuinely boost your morale. And again, this doesn't necessarily just have to be about work. We'll talk more about that shortly. And then the final of the five areas is about keeping yourself healthy. So we all have a lot of stress factors in our lives at the moment on top of whatever was stressing you before. And the best, best way to minimise both short and long term issues caused by stress is to get or stay healthy, both physically and mentally. So at a very basic level, your personal health is the most important aspect of how productive you are during remote work. So if you spend all day at home sitting at a desk for weeks or months at a time, eventually your health is going to start deteriorating. So it's important that we stand up and move around, that we take regular breaks and that we know when to stop working at the end of the day. And all of this is part of looking after our mental health. So, Standing up and moving around, it's really easy to get engrossed in a computer screen when there aren't any colleagues to come and say hi or any lunch to go and get. Um, so you may need to actually set a time to remind yourself or set it, actually physically set a timer. A lot of apps have little reminders that say every you know, 25 minutes or every 50 minutes, get up and move around. But you need to remind yourself to periodically stretch your neck, stretch your arms, stretch your shoulders. Um, consider attending meetings while you're standing up. If you can, get the blood flowing. If you can get to office works and you, and you want to, I, I recently purchased for myself um, a standing desk that sits on top of my um, dining table. I do have a gas lift chair so I can adjust my height, but it means that I can adjust the height and get all my monitors, my laptop, my keyboard, my mouse, all up to standing height where I can still look straight at the computer, but it means that I'm getting bit of blood flow going um, and we're doing a 10,000 step challenge at work at the moment and it also means that I can actually march on the spot and get a few steps in while I'm working. So standing desks are one way you can avoid atrophy but you should also try to stand up at least once an hour and stretch your legs. We also, one of the things that we don't realise when we're sitting in front of a computer all day, and it's worse when we're working from home because that's how all of our interaction is through that screen, is that we tend to stare at the screen. And when you're staring at the screen, your blink rate slows right down. So staring at a screen is very detrimental to your eyes. So even if you've got blue light filters, I've got blue light filters in my glasses, but you can have blue light filters on the computer. Um, so it's important that you take a few seconds to look away from your screen. So look off into the distance, look at something outside, focus on something that's at a different distance from where you're looking. Um, so stare out the window, look at a plant on your desk, just don't look at the screen. And you need to do that every 15 minutes or so. If you get to the end of the day and your eyes are red, it's usually because they're actually dry. So you also need to blink a lot because when we stare, we stop, our blink rate slows down and then we're not lubricating our eyes. So that's really important as well. Very important that we take breaks and we know when to stop working. So when we're in an office, it's a very different situation because you move around to speak to your colleagues. The kitchen and the bathroom are usually further away from your desk. So you need to do some steps to get there and, and have a little bit of activity to get to the kitchen, to get to the bathroom. You'll see others go to lunch, so that prompts you mentally, okay, it's time to go to lunch. And you see others go home at the end of the day and that prompts you, okay, that's time to stop working. So it's, we, should, we don't wanna be tempted to work through our lunch break. And we don't wanna just sit and work nonstop for long periods. So take designated breaks, change your status and move away from your home office. It's also a challenge 
but don't be tempted to eat at your desk. So take a break, go outside, pat the cat, whatever you need to do, have a mental and physical break from the work environment. So those types of breaks, as I said, they occur naturally when you're in an office. It's very different when you're working from home. You need to control those breaks yourself. And absolutely critically, we need to look after our mental health. So we, and that includes things like staying hydrated, getting exercise and fresh air if you can, um, eating healthfully and avoiding too much alcohol or sugar. Now, as humans, we are all social creatures. And all of us are, whether we're introverts or extroverts, we are social creatures and we need interactions with other humans. So we're used to social interaction because social interaction facilitates cooperation and closeness. So we have to fill that socialising gap while we're working remotely. So it's a good idea to find a colleague that you can hit up when you're feeling the need to chat with someone. Um, if there's not somebody in your work environment that you feel comfortable doing that with, there may be somebody, a friend who works elsewhere but is going through the same experience. So hop, hop on a social video call um, instead of Slack or, or whatever. So I've got a friend who works in my team and we just, you know, usually once a day, we'll just jump on and have a quick chat with each other and catch up and we touch base, not just about work, but how everything's going. And if we need to vent, she's somebody I can vent to, I'm someone she can vent to. And we, we, we actually work in different, we're, we're in different states. So we never get to do that in the office. We're used to doing that. Um, online, but if that person is normally somebody that you would go and talk to, or you'd go for a walk with at lunchtime, just jump on your on your chat and say, "If you've got a minute, I need to have a vent," and jump on the phone and just do that. You need to have those interactions with people. So that's really it. That's the five productivity tips that we talked about. So again, just to reiterate, the, the location of where you're working is very important. So having a clear work environment, being comfortable and being able to separate your work and home life. Making sure that you're getting ready for work, that you're preparing for the day, exercising, getting dressed, having breakfast, all of those things so that you're mentally prepared to start the day. So that when you move into that location, your brain is ready, right? This, I'm at work now. Have a plan for the day, have a plan for the week. Make sure that you're managing your tasks, that you're prioritising your tasks and that you're managing your time appropriately. Don't try and schedule eight hours worth of work, of work in an eight hour day, it won't happen. Uh, make sure that you're staying engaged with your team and that you're not relying heavily on text-based communication. As humans, we're not going to be productive if we're not both physically and mentally healthy. And part of staying healthy is by engaging with others and using our tools, being able to engage face-to-face, -face, being able to talk to somebody, hear another human voice. And very, very importantly, keep yourself healthy. Um, I, I know that I'm not as good as I should be about the standing up and moving around. It has helped that I did get a, a stand-up desk. So if you do have that opportunity, you think that's something that's worthwhile, grab yourself a stand-up desk. Um, it is really important that you take breaks and you know when to stop working and that you, you do what you can to look after your mental health. It's even harder at the moment because there are so many stresses. So you don't want stress from work to pile on with everything else that's already happening. So I would hope that these tips have helped you somewhat and that as we continue in with um, working remotely, that we're able to, to come out of the other end of this and we're not sort of all ragged and just desperate to go back to the office. Um, now we do of course have, as we're a training company, we do of course have some training um, that's related to productivity. Uh, we've got a very good course around time management and productivity. Um, and that sits in our professional development space. We've got a brand new course that's only been added to our, um, to our website and our schedule in the last two weeks. And that's called Managing the Virtual Workplace. Um, and of course, we've got um, application training around using things like Teams. So there'll be links to those in the presentation that comes out. You can find them on our website or if you want more information, just get in contact with us. 
Um, and so I think that very neatly brings us around to question time. Awesome. Thanks for that great session, Sue. I know I was guilty of a, a lot of tips that you, you shared with us, so it was really helpful. Um, but if you haven't yet submitted a question, please do so in the control panel and we'll be able to answer it for you guys. So I'll have a quick look to see if we've got any questions. Not seeing any. Nope. I'll give it a few more moments in case the question comes through. Yeah, we did have some come through at the end of, um, after we yeah. said goodbye, I think last time. So happy yeah. to, to stay online. <laughs> I think most of the people are probably used to the format now. Um, okay. Got some great feedback here, but no questions, unfortunately. <laughs> so if we don't have any questions, uh, I'll conclude today's session. I wanna thank everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. And if you have been following us for the past five weeks, we really thank you for joining us. And thank you, Sue, for that great presentation. Um, I hope to see you guys in our next webinars. And I hope you all stay very safe and have a great weekend. Thanks, Thanks. guys. Bye.